1963, my son Stephen died. He was four years old. But on the eve of his funeral, I'd had was laying in bed, definitely wasn't asleep, and I felt as if I was being lifted off of the mattress. Suddenly Stephen was with me, and with a man, I didn't know the man, and Stephen had wanted me to wear a bright yellow dress, which is what I wore for the funeral. My father saw me dressed in this and I thought I'd gone a, a bit funny, um, until I explained what had happened. It was his turn to be a little bit shocked because I then described the man who was with Stephen and it um, ended up being my grandfather who I'd never met and who I believe had died before I was born. Well, that grieving mother was typical of the many people who confided deathbed experiences to Dr. Peter Fenwick here. He's a consultant neuropsychiatrist and he's here now together with his colleague, Dr. Sam Parnia, who wrote this book, What Happens When We Die? And you're a critical care doctor, Sam. That's right. So you, you, you've worked together and, and you know each other's views. And you've been doing this for many years now, haven't you? Uh, the near, near-death experience for yeah. about 20 years. So what, I mean, what can, uh, you know, broadly speaking, <laughs> you've come up with an extraordinary compendium, really, of, of people's experiences, which have led you broadly to say that a lot of people seem to get visited by a dead relative when they are about to die. Is that right? Yes, there are three things which happen. Just before you die, in the two, three days before you die, um, you may have a dead relative who comes along and talks to you. Very comforting, wonderful, wonderful experiences for the dying. And they usually say that they're going to help them through the dying process. So that's one set of things. Right. The next one is that sometimes the person at the moment of death will go and visit somebody, maybe in a different town, even a different country, and tell them that they've just died. And again, it's, it's a wonderfully comforting thing for the relatives. You mean, you mean for example, and this hopefully will, won't happen for many, many years, but I could be about to go to sleep and suddenly see the image of my, my mother, much older than she is now, telling me that she's just died, uh, and I telephone wherever she is, whatever, and, it, and it's true, she's died. That's correct. That, it seems wow. to be exactly like that. Well, that is, is, is now, is, I would characterize that as extrasensory perception. Or how would you categorize it? Or can There's you not categorize it? There, well, we're trying to study this phenomenon more, and Peter's been doing research very recently in this area. Mm -hmm. But there are many, many anecdotes like this, um, really, for over a century now, of both experiences that people have when they're about to die, where they may see deceased relatives, or these, these deathbed coincidences where you seem to somehow know that a dead uh, a, a loved one may be about to pass away and then it's confirmed. So this implies, then that it's not, that this implies then that it's not an overactive imagination. There is clearly some connection being made in the, in, in the brain, in the, human, in the living human brain, with actual events at a remote distance. Yes, the seem, it seems to be that way because the, there has to be a very close connection. It doesn't, you can't walk down the street and suddenly will come some stranger no, no, no. will will uh, tell you that they're just dying. Mm. But if it's a very close connection, like a mother so, and son, something like that, then it does occur. And so, um, and also, I mean, I, I noticed this when my own father was dying. Um, when I was, I was the help, we were all sitting with him in the days of his death, he, he, he died at home. And um, I noticed that a few days before he died, he had imaginary, com what I assumed to be imaginary conversations with people who I couldn't see in the room, but he obviously could because he was smiling, he was gesticulating, he even held out his hand to shake somebody's yes. hand at some point. He wasn't well enough to tell me who he'd been talking to, but it had obviously been a very pleasurable experience for him, and a couple of days later he did die. Now that you say that's common as well, that, don't you? That, that's very common. And but is that hallucination? Um, well, what's a hallucination? A hallucination is something which you can't share with other people. Mm. But it's not always a hallucination because sometimes the relatives of the dying see the person as well. Or nurses. Now, we're going to hear a nurse's story in just two seconds, but I, I vividly remember a similar discussion we had here a couple of years ago when a nurse came in and told us an extraordinary story. And, and these are quite common amongst nurses, and they generally don't yes. talk about them because they're kind of a little embarrassing. Yes, very embarrassing. Yeah, um, uh, but uh, late one night, three, three, three in the morning, she went down, she was on the night shift, she went to check on an old lady who was dying, in a small private room at the end of the ward. And as she opened the door to go in, a man came out and brushed past her. And she, afterwards, she couldn't understand why she wasn't startled and didn't challenge him, because what's a man doing on the ward at, at three in the morning? But it didn't bother her at all. It seemed normal, and she apologized for being in this way and walked in. And the, the reading light was on over this old lady's bed, and she was conscious and awake and, and shining with excitement. And she said, did you see him, dear? And the nurse said, 
what? And she said, my, my, my late husband, he's been sitting here talking to me for the last 15 minutes. He's been telling me about paradise, and it all sounds wonderful. And the nurse said, well, um, no, I didn't see anything. I think he might have had a dream. No, no, dear, he's been here. And she did see somebody leaving the room, um, who then vanished, just disappeared into, into nowhere. You talked about the story of, a, of, of a, a doctor who tended to a man who... Um, a golfer who collapsed on the on the golf course yes. with a heart attack. Yes. The doctor happened to be there, and as he approached the man to help him, he was dead. He said he saw a white form rising from his body. It, it's amazing when you start asking people what they see at the time of death uh, when their relatives die. A lot of people see shapes leaving the body, can leave through the head. Sometimes the shape rises from the body. Sometimes it rises from the body and stays just hovering above the bed before finally uh, disappearing. What, what, do, what do you think, Sam, then? What do you, what do you think is, is going on here? Are we talking about life after death, or are we talking about the need to comfort ourselves desperately when we're in extremists? I think this is, I mean, this is the big key question. I mean, what we know is for thousands of years, of course, we've been interested in what happens when we die. And there have been anecdotal reports of very interesting experiences, very profound experiences. People describe seeing a deceased relatives, but they may describe seeing a very bright, warm, welcoming light. They often describe separating from themselves and watching things that are going on down below. Unfortunately, from a scientific and medical point of view, we have not taken this very seriously, and we haven't really taken the study of death very seriously until now. Only 30 years ago, the first reports came in the medical uh, literature of these, these interesting experiences. And what we have found out so far, there's been a real surge in the last few years to study this phenomena, is that there seems to be some evidence suggesting that when people have reached the clinical point of death, when the brain has shut down and they're, they're actually going through the dying process, that somehow, paradoxically, and we cannot explain it yet scientifically, their mind or consciousness appears to continue to function. So they have well-structured, lucid thought processes with reasoning memory formation. <laughs> and what we're trying, at the time, when all our studies have shown the brain does not work, there's no electricity in the brain. So if this is confirmed with larger studies, which is what we're actually in the middle of doing, Peter and I, right now in this country, then this is a huge discovery for us. And the key is that we don't know. The frontier right now in science is understanding what is the human mind, what is consciousness, what is a hallucination, what is real. We know that these things, we, scientifically, we cannot say they're hallucinations because society is what tells us what is real and not. You mm -hmm. know, for example, somebody who experiences maternal love, we can identify the areas in the brain that mediate love, compassion, anger. But that doesn't mean that because we've identified the areas of the brain that that makes love hallucination. So mm. if you imagine if everybody in the world had a near-death experience, then we'd all be saying, of course it's real. Mm. Yeah. There's no question about it, because society is what gives us definitions of but, real versus But as scientists, real. you've yet to reach your conclusions on all the, and maybe you never will, uh, on, on all the studies that you've well, put together. Th there's evidence is beginning to accumulate. First of all, uh, before we started this, we thought that they were rare. They're not. They're very common. Mm. Mm. So people have them. Secondly, they have an enormously beneficial effect for the grieving relatives mm. Mm. because they know that the person is going somewhere safe and that yes. they're okay. And thirdly, um, and I think most importantly, we, it's beginning to tell us something about the nature and structure of mind. Yes. And it yes. seems to be extended in a way that science at the moment doesn't fully understand. Well, Judy knows this story, but it's, it's one of the strongest memories in our, f in our family from, from my childhood when uh, well, I woke up in the middle of the night once and my mother was, was awakened very distressed and walking up and down on, 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 our, on our landing with my father's arm around her shoulder and my sister was woken up and we were, the house was in uproar. And she'd had a terrible visitation in the night. She, she'd had a, a sort of jumbled message that she thought my father's mother was very ill or had died. So we didn't have a phone. They had to go to a phone box, telephone shop, shop, no, everything was fine. And then at about 6 o'clock in the morning, my mother was still in a terrible state, a telegram boy arrived, and her own mother in Canada, 3,000 miles away, had been taken desperately ill and was dying uh, without warning, and she flew out there. And we've always felt that she had some kind of message in the night across the Atlantic, you know, without, without the help of a phone. And anyway, I'm sure that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, you know, I have to say the, the most interesting thing to me is that it all sounds quite comforting. Yeah. Yes, it so, is. yes, it is. Yeah, and helpful thing. to the and breathing relatives. Well, yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for coming in, and good luck with the rest of your, your studies on this. Yeah. Thank and you if, very uh, much. if you've got a story that you'd like to add to Professor Fenwick's research, then please go to our website, which is channel4.com forward slash Rich and Judy, and we'll pass them on to him.